This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Peter, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Thank you for having me back, Bob. Well, one of the hot button issues in the financial news has been the uh, deterioration of the Japanese carry trade. And I thought, who do I know that knows anything about this? <laughs> and you were like the eighth guy, but you answered no. <laughs> you were the first guy I went to. <laughs> True story. So can you just, let's start with, you know, with the real basic, like, you know, for people who don't, mm-hmm. don't know what that term is, this is going to be the one episode where they're going to say, finally, somebody actually explained it to me like I'm six. <laughs> so can you explain what the heck it, it is just in general? And then we'll talk about the specifics. All right, from the eighth least bad expert in the world on the Japanese carry trade. So in short, uh, hedge funds can go out and borrow on yen because interest rates in Japan are essentially zero, right? So it's more or less free money. And then they can turn around and take those free yen and then go buy treasuries that pay 5% or they can just put it in NVIDIA that pays a lot more than 5%. And so from the hedge funds perspective, this is free money. However, the problem is that if... The Japanese yen suddenly gets stronger, then the hedge fund, you know, they might have borrowed 100 million in yen. And then now all of a sudden it's going to cost them $120 million to pay back that loan. So at that point, they get a let, margin let me just, call. Let me stop you just real. Yep. So again, I'm, I'm for re- it's not like it's the, the money's not free per se. It's like free to rent the money. Like you, eventually you still owe it to them, but yes. you don't have to pay like a, a time usage charge if the interest rate. However, if if you're investing in if you're ultimately investing in some U.S. dollar, dollar denominated asset, you're taking the yen, whatever amount they give you, you turn it into the equivalent of a hundred million dollars U.S. dollars, do it, and then you're saying if the yen in the meantime strengthens against the dollar by twenty percent, well now just to pay back the loan, even though there was no interest charge on their end, now you got to come up with the effectively one hundred and twenty million U.S. dollars because the the dollar weakened against the yen during the course. Exactly right. If you want free money, that takes a lot more political donation. Yeah. <laughs> so right, this is this is simply free rental yeah, of yeah. the money, uh, and right. So if they get that margin call, then at that point they have to do two things. One of them is that they have to sell all the stuff that they had bought. So they have to sell the treasuries. They have to sell the Nvidia, and then number two is that they take the proceeds. Right when they sell their Nvidia, they get a bunch of dollars. And then they might go back and unwind part of that loan. They might pay some of it back. And so that means that now they're dump or they're selling dollars in exchange for yen. That makes the yen get even stronger. And so you get this feedback loop mm-hmm. where the yen can keep getting stronger and stronger. So that's what happened, what, we're about a week and a half ago uh, at this point. And the yen in, I think, about a three-week period, it went from 160 to 140, which is a very big move for the yen, that was catastrophic for Japanese markets. So the Japanese stock exchange dropped, I think at one point it was about 25% that it dropped. And the reason there is because if the yen suddenly gets 15% stronger, that more than wipes out the profits of corporate Japan, which is extremely export dependent, right? And let, so- let me, st- let, let, yeah. let me stop you. Because again, yeah, yeah. I, I want this to be something that somebody who really doesn't no, know. No, for sure. So when you say yeah. the yen strengthened from 160 to 140, you meant originally, it took roughly 160 yen to get one dollar in the foreign exchange yep. markets, and then now because the yen strengthened, it only takes 140 yen to get one dollar. Right. So the dollar's weakening, exactly. the yen is strengthening, and then as we know, other things equal a stronger currency makes it harder to export. And so Japanese companies that were reliant on exports, if the yen suddenly strengthens, that means like. From Americans' point of view, Japanese goods are now more expensive, that their dollars that right. they might use to buy Japanese goods now are weaker, so Japanese goods seem more expensive. And so hence, those Japanese exporting firms say, oh, geez, this is going to be tough. And so then that gets reflected immediately in the stock prices of those companies. And in general, the Japanese exchange took a big hit. Right, Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and so, right, so on the one hand, the Japanese exchange uh, got hit really hard, lost about 25% in, I believe, about a week. Uh, and then, meanwhile, you had these these carry traders who were cashing out uh, their bets in the U.S. market, and so we got slammed on Monday. The When the smoke cleared, it was not that big of a move. I think it was about 2% on the day, a 2% decline uh, in the Standard & Poor in New York. So it was not that bad when the smoke cleared, but intraday, 
like during the course of the trading day, it was a lot worse than that. Uh, something called VIX, which is a measure of market volatility, also known as a measure of market risk. VIX spiked to levels that we haven't seen outside of COVID. We haven't seen since 2008. Mm -hmm. That got a lot of people excited. There was chatter about whether this is a 1987-style uh, sort of uh, flash crash. Well, is it a 1987-style collapse, or is it a 2008-style collapse, or is it just going to bounce right off because it's a flash crash? So we can get mm -hmm. in-depth into all of those three outcomes. Okay, so as of right now, like, do you have a set? And yes, I do want to explore those three different things, but as of right this moment— What's the either like your view or if, if like what the consensus is it, it, right now? Do people think, OK, that's behind? Oh, actually, I, me I meant to ask, is what triggered it that the Bank of Japan raised interest rates ever so slightly? What's interesting, I think, is that what triggered it was the job readings in the previous week. <clears throat> so there was a very bad job report on Friday and that had Coleman or that 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 was coming after several previous bad jobs reports. And the Friday report actually had both Citibank and JP Morgan predicting a full point of interest rate cuts in the next two Fed meetings. So in central bank land, that's pretty close to panic if you're cutting mm -hmm. an entire point over two meetings. So that, that actually preceded the Japan move. Uh, and then the Japan move was set off. Uh, this is sort of newsworthy. Uh, the Japan move was set off by just a very, very tiny move uh, up in the Bank of Japan's interest rates, All right? So they hiked from, I think it was 0.15% to 0.25. That is very, very small, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, the Fed currently is running about five and a quarter, five and a half. Mm -hmm. So it's a very small move, but what it did was signal to the market that the end is nigh for zero interest rate policy, which has been running for something like 20 years. Okay, so really what sparked it or what 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 sort of spread the gasoline was the U.S. jobs report that is now suggesting that recession is either coming or it's already here. But then the match that lit it was the Japan move. And what makes the Japan move interesting is that it was so small that it raises the question whether, you know, if Japan tries to normalize policy and get it back towards 3 4%, like most central banks, can the Japanese economy sustain that? And will there be sort of blowback onto other economies, including the U.S., or other financial systems, including the U.S.? Okay, and just to, again, with all this stuff, you know, it, it so happen, often happens in economics, you have to frame everything as a, you know, other things equal, because there's 19 right. different things going on, and there's feedback yep. effects and whatever. But is this true, that other things equal, if there's a carry trade going on, then when the the low interest rate, like in this case, Japan, if they raise their interest rates, that hurts the carry trade because, you know, part of the issue was, oh, you can borrow so cheaply basically for free. And now yep. that's not as true. And also other things equal when they raise interest rates, that makes their currency more attractive. So that would tend to strengthen their currency. And then vice versa, if in conjunction with that, everyone thinks the U.S. is cutting interest rates, well, then other things equal, that makes its assets less, you know, people don't want to invest, international investors don't want to have as much rolling over in T-bills if they go from you know five point two five down to two or something that they and so again just it, it goes the other way so that would tend to weaken the dollar and so these things are all kind of going the wrong way if what you wanted to do was maintain a nice little carry trade. Exactly right. It's getting squeezed from both ends, right? Because the carry trade fundamentally depends on there being a difference in the interest rates between these two economies, mm -hmm. and so right, it's it's getting squeezed on both ends, which is taking the profit out of it, uh, and then of course as hedge funds exit that carry trade, they sort of swamp their own lifeboat, right? So, yeah. you know, they're now piling into the yen, which is then making the value of the yen go up even faster. Okay. So it's it's just a specific application of kind of the general idea that if something is overvalued, then when everyone tries to run for the exits, it just, yep. you know, makes it Bingo. worse and, you know, brings the potential catastrophe, you know, to your doorstep. Okay. So it, do you want to now circle back maybe now that we get it, you know, we had the, the snapshot of what the heck the situation is just when you were talking about those three other historical episodes. So like 1987, what's, what's the quick synopsis? And again, you know, feel free to 
embellish a little bit, not embellish, but give some more context in these. <laughs> Don't assume that like everyone listening knows like what happened mm -hmm. to each one of them. You're just jogging right. their memory. Like maybe no one's ever, some of these, you know, we might have some young listeners that they didn't even know something. What, what happened in 1987? I don't know. What yeah. was that? Yeah, so in 1987, uh, it was called Black Monday, and the U.S. stock market crashed. From memory, it was 24% in two days. I think it was yeah, that sounds more like right to me. And you know, that's a very, very big move um, for the stock market to do in two days. And you know, of course, it invited comparisons to 1929. And a lot of people were saying the world is ending. And what was interesting is that stocks completely recovered within nine months. All right, so that was. The biggest stock market collapse since 1929, nine months later, it was gone like it never even happened. Uh, and then we can contrast that with what happened in 2008, which is that stocks also collapsed. They're really sparked by the Lehman collapse. Uh, in my opinion, the spark was really that w, uh, George W. Bush, the president at the time, he said that he would not bail out Lehman. And mm -hmm. Wall Street had been sort of running on this expectation that they were going to get bailed out if they got into trouble. Uh, and so you had this massive, you know, sort of financial collapse and it turned out they all got bailed out in the end. So I guess it was a happy story for Wall Street. But at any rate, in 2008, we had, you know, sort of the initial stages of it were similar size crashes. They weren't as big as 1987, but they were large. And then that just kept on going, right? The market kept going down and there it took about five years for markets to recover. Ultimately, it took until about 2013. And so the question at this point is we see a big move on Monday is that, you know, is it just flash crash? Is it just uh, like a goofy mistake? You know, the, the signals were crossed, the hedge funders were trying to stampede out of Japan. Was mm -hmm. it just a flash crash that's just gonna bounce right off? That's option one. Option two, are we looking at the beginning of a 1987 style crash where markets are fundamentally gonna recover pretty quickly? Or number three, are we looking at 2008 where it's gonna take a long time? And I think that the it's too early to say whether this is just a flash crash that's bouncing right off. We're getting sort of ongoing volatility day by day, and markets are going up or down about a percent or two, which is that's relatively large moves um, mm -hmm. for the market. So I think it's still too early to say whether this is just sort of you know Wall Street having one of its uh, hallucinations. Okay, uh, I think that it's worth discussing whether this is a 1987 or 2008. And within those two possibilities, I think what separates the two of them is that in 1987, the economy, uh, well, really the president <laughs> was more pro-growth. Uh, the economy was just starting to get these, these sort of debt problems that are now metastasized into a cancer 30 years later. Uh, but at the time, I think in 1987, the economy was pretty sound fundamentally, uh, relatively speaking. On the other hand, in 2008, we had a lot of sort of wily coyote moments where there were mm -hmm. there were various uh, aspects of the economy where they were still sort of floating. Like ev everybody knew that the party was over, but nobody was going home yet. Uh, and so between the two of those, I think that right now it probably feels to me anyway a little bit closer to two thousand eight. Uh, partly because we do have all of these uh, financial issues. You know, we we have unprecedented levels of debt. We have unprecedented levels of deficits in peacetime. And then, of course, once we get fully into the recession, or if we do, heaven forbid, start a war, then those will get much worse. So given those, um, the sort of debt overhangs, the, you know, low productivity growth, low economic growth, I feel like we're a lot closer uh, to 2008 scenario. And of course, one of the I think interesting sort of side notes here is that you and I are our instinct to look to the economic causes of these things, sort of direct economic causes. Uh, Charles Payne on Fox News, he put up a chart the other day I thought was interesting. He tracked out the NASDAQ versus Kamala Harris's odds on betting markets. And mm -hmm. it was like one for one. I mean, immediately when Kamala started rising, uh, when this sort of media campaign went on about how she is so beloved, almost immediately the Nasdaq started falling. And mm. so the reason that, you know, setting aside uh, partisan and, you know, how we vote and whatnot, I think that's interesting because it suggests that if Kamala, whether it's under her own steam or whether the media is going to carry her over the, the line, if Kamala has decent prospects of becoming president, then I, I, I think it's most certainly not a flash crash that this could be something more serious and ongoing for at least the next couple of months until the election resolves it either way. That's interesting. Yeah, it was funny. There was a uh, for years, you know, during the like Ben Bernanke tenure and the Obama years, 
I was going around giving talks like to financial minded crowds. And one of my favorite charts was to show it was the S and P 500 against the, uh, the feds balance sheet, you know, like the feds total assets and they moved yep. hand in glove and I didn't like have to yep. tinker with it. It was just the Fred, you know, charting tool. When I just picked those two data sets, boom, it lined them up and they, they, it looked was eerie how similar yeah. they were. And so of course my point was, yeah, the markets are doing well, but you know, it's really just QE driving. And it's certainly not yep. because the prospect of a carbon tax or, you know, Obamacare is really making the markets think, yes, this is great for productivity growth. So that was my story. And then where that, when that broke down though, was when Trump got elected and all of a sudden there was a big jump where the S and P clearly appreciated more than, you know, cause I think they're at that point, they were just rolling over their, their assets. Uh, um, you know, they had, they had tapered or whatever the term they used. So anyway, so it, it did seem like the markets and also because it was such a surprise. And so the, the story I was telling them was say what you will about, you know, his personal life, whether you think he's funny or a jerk, what, but it sure looks like when the markets originally thought Hillary Clinton was going to be the president, they had priced that in. And then yep. when I was like, oh, no, actually, it's Donald Trump. And all of a sudden, there was a big jump. And, you know, he could say, oh, it's because of tax cuts. Whatever the issue is, yeah. So that wouldn't surprise me if this time around, if, if the markets had been pricing and thinking, there's no way Biden's beating Trump this time around. And then all of a sudden, there's a switcheroo. And, oh, shoot, it might be Kamala. I could see how that might lead to some reassessment of, you know, future dividends. Or yeah, I should and, say future and, after tax dividends. Right, right, <laughs> right. Always what you actually put in your pocket. And I think that's uh, sort of an important wider issue is that there are two ways to grow an economy. You can buy it or you can build it. Right. And that first, you know, where you're talking about the Fed pumping out liquidity, I mean, that very much describes what we've had over the past couple of years. Right? We've had an enormous amount uh, of functionally printed money pouring into the markets. I was really coming from all angles. Right. You've got it with the uh, switching the, the Treasury switching from bonds to bills. I mean, just mm -hmm. have these endless sources of trillions flooding in. And that's not real growth. That's that's bought growth, right? That's that's where your markets are going up. You might even be growing the economy, uh, increasing consumer spending, but that was bought, right? And then the other side of it is when you have productivity improvements that where you know markets go up, uh, consumers are better off, not because you pumped four or six trillion into the markets. Uh, but rather because, you know, we actually build a better mousetrap today. We can produce more with less. Yeah, definitely. Um, circling back to another thing you mentioned about, you know, how, where, how the debt now is, it's surpassing where it was, at, you know, at the end of World War II in terms of debt to GDP in the U.S. And yeah, and it's, you know, people have made this point before, but I think it's worth emphasizing back then. So some of the guys like Paul Krugman and Dean Baker and people on that camp, let alone the MMT people, they will try to you know, say, oh, you right-wing fiscal hawks, you've been crying wolf for 20 years at this point. Give me a break. Look at the debt was this high. This isn't you know something crazy for U.S. history. It was this high at the end of World War II. And everybody knows the 50s and 60s were great you know, periods for economic growth. And so did it. But among other differences, as you alluded to, back then the reason the debt got so big was because of the ridiculous deficits during the World War II years. And then after that, in like 46 through 48, I think they actually ran surpluses. And then going forward, the debt, you know, even when they did have debt, it was pretty low, as, or sorry, a deficit, it was pretty low as a share of the economy. And it wasn't until the early 70s where the deficits really started getting big again in terms of share of the economy, probably having something to do with the gold standard. And so this time around, though, it's not like, oh, yeah, there was a one-off expenditure because of COVID. Right. And now we can go back and run some surpluses for a bit. No, they, they're totally painted into a corner just yep. with Social Security and Medicare and how that's, you know, the population's aging over time and the interest on the, the existing stock of debt, if interest rates just kind of stay where they are, the, like that right there, I think, you know, already the, they paid more in interest than they did to the military this last yep. fiscal year. So I, I don't, you know, if you want to just elaborate on, on that point, yeah. that it's it's not just like, oh yeah, let's just do what we did in the 50s. You can't, you can't. Uh, you could if you dramatically cut the. <laughs> the well, sure, yeah, it, it the, wouldn't be. It wouldn't just be. Yeah, oh, let's stop. Right. Let's stop building so many tanks and bombers to exactly. ship them over to Europe. Like that's. It's going to be a different policy choice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You've got a structural um, problem at this point. So it's one thing if you're spending thirty thousand to replace the roof. That's one thing because you don't do it that often. Mm -hmm. But now, if you're doing that every single month, you are going to be in the poorhouse very quickly, and that's exactly what we're doing now. 
So, you know, we're looking at deficits that are they're on track to, I think last year was 1.7 trillion. They goofed around with student loans, how they counted it, but something like 1.7. Uh, it is on a, you know, it's on a one-way uh, ticket up. Uh, if we have permanent $2 trillion deficits, you know, again, you want to go back to the point that this is in peacetime and this is an alleged economic boom. Like, according to these statistics, we have very robust GDP. We have, you know, historically epic jobs numbers, and yet we have a $2 trillion deficit. Well, if that's the case, then when we do have a recession, if you look back to the past couple of recessions over the past 40 years, every recession you translate inflation, inflation adjusted, you're looking about two, three trillion every single inflation that the deficit gets worse. That's partly because taxes collapse and it's partly because social spending goes up, right? There, there's even normal people actually want government to spend more because so many people are hurting. So at that point, we are not going to be looking at two trillion deficits. We're going to be looking at what, four, five mm -hmm. trillion deficits? That is without a, well, anyway, that is without precedent. To do something like that on an ongoing basis, we have not been there before. I suspect we might have been in um, during the Civil War uh, when you would probably know the inflation rates better, but I think we had, anyway, we certainly had double digit inflation in the Civil War. Uh, oh, yeah, for sure. Basis. Like in the North, yeah. in the South, the South was, you know, much worse to certain Yeah, the period. South was yeah. hyperinflation, right? Yeah, so, you know, those levels of spending would be unprecedented basically since the last time we had hyperinflation in this country. Yeah. Um, maybe is it worth pointing out? Here, here's something to throw at you. As far as the 1987 crash, there are some Chicago school types who say, you know, financial markets, it's just a random walk and it has nothing to do intrinsically with the real economy. And that's just a myth people have. And, and their go-to example is, 1987, there was, you know, the worst percentage-wise crash in U.S. history, and nothing happened. So everyone saying the 1929 stock market crash caused the Great Depression. They don't know what they're talking about. Look at the counterexample of 87. And the, the, the answer is, thank goodness we had Alan Greenspan in there, and he just turned on the monetary spigots, and everybody got, you know, reassured, and boom. And so that doesn't that clearly show its poor monetary policy, in particular, if the Fed hadn't been so tight in, you know, 1930 and 31, that's why we had the Great Depression. This Everything was fine. It was sustainable. Stop talking about these structural imbalances. You guys, you know, not, nothing. Random walk. Keep the money flowing and we're all good. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of Benjamin Graham's uh, quote that in the short run, the market is a voting machine. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. So mm -hmm. indeed, the market does the darndest things. I mean, if you look at Monday, right? So nothing substantially changed between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And the market moved, I don't know, 800 points or something. Yeah. But by uh, the way, I should just clarify for people. Yeah. I'm going out of town. And so, folks, we're uh, Peter and I are having this conversation on August 9th. So they're not going to hear it, Peter, until another you know week from when you and I are talking. So the Monday that people are hearing this is two Mondays ago that you're talking about. Okay, you good. So, yeah. Yeah, and you know, to be clear, I have no idea what the stocks are going to do in the next week. <laughs> that goes to Warren Buffett's famous expression: uh, "When asked what stocks will do," and he said they will fluctuate. So yes, yeah, yeah. stocks will <laughs> fluctuate over the coming week. Uh, as for the question on the depression, of course, that's their line, right? Is that you know, by all accounts, they inflated the nineteen. Well, I'm not sure about all accounts, but it should be by all accounts. Mm -hmm. They inflated in the 1920s. And then their solution would have been, I guess, to just keep it going, right, to keep right. inflating into the 30s. And they're upset that uh, that they took took the punch bowl away. Of course, what should have happened at that point is that all of those malinvestments should have been liquidated. So all those crappy businesses that started with the cheap money. This is what we did in the 1920-21 uh, so-called forgotten depression. We just kind of let it resolve on its own. Thing would have been over in a jiff. Uh, instead, of course, they didn't, right? Both Hoover and FDR, as you know, were very interventionist. They were sort of looking for their excuse to take over the economy, uh, and they did. So at this point, I think the depression should be very squarely put on the shoulders of Hoover and FDR. Rather than FDR being the savior who saved us from the depression, he was the one who made it great. He was the one who made it last for 10 plus years. But right, they're fundamentally Can I stop you right there, Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah so, please. So that, that's the way I, you know, and I have a book, folks, politically incorrect guide to the Great Depression, the New Deal, where I, I think I say exactly how you just framed it, that, yeah, strictly speaking, I think it was the Fed, you know, the easy money policies of the 20s that made a crash inevitable, 
However, had they they're truly been, you know, had Hoover really been the laissez faire guy that people say he was, there would have been a, you know, an 18 month awful economy and then it would have bounced back just like in all previous ones where it was a pretty painful, you know, adjustment, but then boom, you you, you start growing out of it, prices all collapse, w- wages in particular, you hit rock bottom and there's, you know, unemployment quickly comes back down as as real wage rates fall and labor becomes cheaper and businesses hire them. And so what turned the, the so yes, there there had to be a crash and a, you know, a, a depression with a small D, but what made it the Great Depression was, yeah, Hoover and FDR's unprecedented interventions. And Hoover even brags about that in his memoirs. You know, he's trying to fix his, his uh, you know, st- stature in the history books. And so he was saying, no, no, I wasn't a do-nothing guy. We did unprecedented peacetime measures to bolster <laughs> employment. I told all the labor unions, don't cut wages. And they listened to me. And I was like, right. Yeah. So that's why labor got artificially more expensive in 30 and 31 when all, you know, the public's pulling their money out of the banks. And so prices are falling and wage rates can't go down. And then, geez, I wonder why unemployment went up to 25%. Maybe that had something to do with it. Yeah. Rothbard's got a great, uh, uh, I guess, metaphor where he talks about locusts, right? So if you have Mm -hmm. locusts who come in and and eat up all the crops once every seven years, uh, well, the locust fighting industry is going to have a natural boom bust to it. And after the locusts go away, all those people are going to be laid off. And so at that point, should the government step in and, you know, provide make work, have them dig holes and fill them up, perhaps raise locusts for them to fight? (laughs) Right. And of course, the obvious solution is no, the government should do absolutely nothing. If Mm. people don't need locust fighters, you know, the other six years, then those guys should go find something else to do. And so that really would have been the solution. The sort of money quote on that, I think, is, uh, I think it was Andrew Mellon, his comment that we need to liquidate everything. We need to liquidate labor, liquidate capital, mm-hmm. liquidate. And of course, unfortunately, for better or for worse, liquidate has two meanings, right? One of them means to uh, allow the price to fall so that it can be traded. So there's actual you know demand at that price, which is what he meant it as. In other words, let the market clear. But there's an unfortunate second meaning, which also means to like vaporize somebody with a ray gun. Right. And right. so that tends to be how the media misreads that. Like, oh my God, how could this monster want to literally vaporize all of the working men and women of America? Uh, but that, I, of I course, would have been the Peter's, solution. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. As the host, let me invoke my privilege. Um, on that, just for in case people don't realize, it's just the level of dishonesty on this one point. <laughs> there are Keynesians, I won't say who, but the guy, his name rhymes with mad salong. And, um, and it was saying like on blog posts and stuff, but, you know, back during like the, you know, 20, 2009, 2000, 2010, when, uh, you know, the, the references to the great depression were in vogue and people, you know, and Republicans were wanting to cut spending and they were saying, Oh no, we don't want to do what Hoover did. Hoover in his own memoirs said that his secretary, treasury secretary came in that he inherited from the Coolidge and, and said, we need to liquidate da 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 da. It just left it at that, leading you to believe that, oh, so that's what they did. <laughs> and on the, the next page of the book, Hoover says, and of course, I didn't agree with him. You know what I mean? So it's just completely misleading to like for people to think, oh, yeah, that's what Hoover did. He did a liquidationism. No, we only know of that story from Hoover's memoirs where he was holding up Mellon to show everyone, I didn't listen to this nut job. I was a good yeah. man of the people. I tried to fight for you, and just what could I do? It was a really bad right. economy. Yep. Yeah, no, it is It is absolutely dishonest. And, you know, of course, the irony is that that would have been what to do. You have to let the prices find their own level. Uh, if you have, you know, too many IT workers, then rather than trying to, you know, make it illegal to 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 lay off tech workers, you got to let their prices fall. You got to let the wages come back down until people want to hire all those people again. That is how the economy gets back to a, you know, sustainable level. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, James Grant in his book, Forgotten Depression, when we're talking about the 1930s, I think that's really a, a good go-to resource to kind of understand uh, where we went wrong, but also how how we should be fighting uh, recessions, which in short, we should do absolutely nothing. You can take care of people who are in dire straits, uh, you know, sort of welfare relief for the people who are, out, who are out and out. But in terms of trying to prop up wages, prop up companies, uh, prop up industries, bail out industries, none of that should be happening because all of, of course, slows the recovery. Because what you fundamentally have to do is uh, sort of wash out all of the dead wood that had built up during uh, the easy money period and, you know, sort of refound the economy on actual sustainable businesses. 
Okay, we got about five minutes here as I'm looking at the clock, Peter. So what do you say you had said of the three scenarios you thought, you know, what we're going through right now to your mind is more reminiscent of the the 2008 situation. So does that mean you think there is a big crash coming, like a, a real downturn in the economy? I think markets are holding their breath to see who wins in November. Um, Mm -hmm. Kamala, we don't know what her policies are since she's been nominated because there seems to be a conspiracy of silence from the media. Uh, If we look at her statements before she inherited the presidency or the uh, nomination on the Democrat side, her policies are substantially to the left of Joe Biden. So, for example, Joe Biden wanted to get rid of the Trump tax cuts if you make over 400, Kamala has said she wants to get rid of all of them. Biden wanted to ban fracking on public lands. Kamala has said she wants no fracking. Pretty much across the board, Kamala is a more extreme version of Joe Biden, uh, basically Jimmy Carter in heels. And so if it looks like they're going to install her, then I think at that point we're on a 2008 trajectory. If, on the other hand, Trump does win, I think it's instructive to look back at what's happening in 2016 where the economy was actually tail end, I think, of the cycle. It had been eight years since the previous recession. That's pretty long for uh, the kind of recessions that the Fed creates. And so we were actually kind of tapering off in 2016. Productivity was down, growth was slowing. And then Trump came in, talked about regulations, talked about tax cuts, especially the corporate tax cut. That got things swinging up again. So I think that a lot of it is going to depend on the election. Given that, I think that the market knows that to the point where we're more or less, I think, going to be in a holding pattern, uh, waiting and seeing. Unless markets, betting markets could do a point where Kamala is basically a sure thing. And at that point, yes, I think that we're going into the 2008 sequence. Okay, so that's interesting, though. So if I understand you, it's you don't think that, oh, yeah, it... it um like the Fed's inflation that they pumped in during the COVID years, you know, it was an unsustainable bubble. And then now that has to come down. And whether it's Ron Paul in there or anybody, like there's going to be a crash, just a matter of how fast do we get through it? You're saying you you could you could see if Trump wins, and especially if he like makes good on cutting taxes and deregulating and blah, 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 and putting in libertarians in his cabinet post. Right. You do think it's conceivable in your mind we could get through the next two, three years without unemployment going above Seven percent, just to give a specific thing. Yeah, yep, yeah. I think seven's the number, and you know, of course, as you mentioned earlier, in economics, there's always 19 things happening, and so mm-hmm. ceteris paribus. Of course, the you know money printing orgy, we are going to have to pay for that. We're going to have to pay uh, more than it cost. But having said, you know, are we going to stay above nominal zero? Uh, uh, n- nominal growth of zero? Uh, Is unemployment going to stay below, let's say, 7%? I think that if Trump comes in, then there is a very good chance of that happening. Uh, If Kamala comes in, then I think we're probably, I think there's a good chance of double-digit unemployment. Okay, so basically you think the United States is racist and sexist, is how I'm hearing. That's, uh, yes, uh, everything depends on American voters being racist and sexist. Yes, that's correct. (laughs) Okay. Well, uh, Peter, for people who want to see more of your analysis and see your videos and such, what, what do they do? Uh, I'm on twi- on X, Twitter, <laughs> x slash Twitter uh, at Prof. St. Ange. And then I've also got a substack, com, And that's P-R-O-F-S-T-O-N-G-E. Yes. Thank you for spelling it out. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Peter, for your time and your insights. Always a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.